So if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I like to look into the different species of humans and pre-humans that have all gone extinct. The reason that I do this is because I would like to learn more about the human evolutionary timeline and how these species differ from each other and what the similarities are. So in a few of my videos that I've made in the past, I have mentioned species from the Paranthropus genus, but it seems like anthropologists aren't agreeing on this placement in its own genus, as some anthropologists actually think that these species belong in the genus of the Australopithecines. The species in the genus of Paranthropus seem to have lived between 2.7 million and 1 million years ago, so for about 1.7 million years they roamed the Earth. My name is Kaylee, and in this video I'm going to look into the three species in the Paranthropus genus. We have Paranthropus boisei, Paranthropus robustus and Paranthropus aethiopicus. And I'm going to look into the placement of them in the Paranthropus genus. So without wasting any more time, let's get into it. And yes, I'm filming in a different location. Sometimes a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. The first thing that I feel like I need to mention is the fact that the Paranthropus species are often referred to as the robust Australopithecines. This has to do with the fact that they are incredibly similar to the species in the Australopithecus genus, but their morphology is a lot more robust. This is also one of the reasons as to why there are anthropologists that can test the genus of Paranthropus and they would like these three species to be placed in the Australopithecus genus. The name Paranthropus holds some significance. It's based on Greek words like para, which means near, and anthropus, which means man. A species of near man, a pre-human species. So the three species in the Paranthropus genus bear the following scientific names for various reasons, and I'll tell you why. Ethiopicus was given this name because of the specimen that were discovered in Ethiopia. The first specimen were found there. Boise was given this name to honor Charles Boise, who actually helped uh, with the funding for the leaky fossil hunting expeditions. And Robustus was given this name because they were a robust Australopithecine when it comes to their skull and their jaws. And the Latin word for strongly built is Robustus. So I hear you think normally I go into like the location. So let's do that. Where were these species discovered? Where did they live? Well, as you can see on the screen here, Paranthropus aethiopicus and Paranthropus boisei seem to have lived in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, while Paranthropus robustus seemed to have only lived in South Africa. When I say have lived, I of course mean that these are the places where their fossils have been discovered, which means that these countries are without a doubt places they inhabited. But unless we find more fossils elsewhere, we can't conclude that they lived in other regions. No fossil evidence, of course, does mean that we can only speculate. And I don't necessarily speculate much when it comes to factual things like this. We have found their fossils in these locations, and until we find them in other locations, we know that they only inhabited these places. But let's move on to the discovery of the most notable fossils in the Paranthropus genus. And yeah, I think let's start with the very first. The first fossils of the Paranthropus genus were discovered in 1938 on a hillside in Kromdraai in South Africa. Yes, I say Kromdraai in the Dutch way. That's just how I am. Um, these were just some fossil fragments and these fragments were shown to Robert Broom from the Transvaal Museum. Broom went back to the hillside at Kromdraai to discover more fossil fragments and these fragments all came from the very same skull. And after his careful examination of the fragments from this skull, he came to the conclusion that this was a new species. It had to do with the unique features that he found 
in the skull, like large premolar and molar teeth and a very robustly built lower jaw. So he actually gave this newly discovered species the name of Paranthropus robustus, a robustly built prehuman. So later on in 1950, a skull was discovered at the Swartkrans cave in South Africa. And this was a skull from an adult and it has been dated to have lived between 2 million and 1.5 million years ago. What we do need to remember is that accurate dates are incredibly difficult to obtain for these South African fossils. This actually has to do with the fact that these fossils lie in cave ground layers that have been disturbed over time by washed in sediments and erosion from the cave roof. Therefore, the sediment in which these fossils are found cannot be exactly measured and we get an approximate window in time, in this case of nearly 500,000 years. Although, you know, in the grand scheme of things and life and human evolution, a date estimate ranging 500,000 years when the fossils are over a million years old is not really that strange. I mean, they're either 2 million years or 1.5 million years old and that just means that it's incredibly old. The oldest sediment in which that skull was found date back to 2 million years ago and the youngest sediment around the skull dates back to 1.5 million years ago. So somewhere in those 500,000 years, the pre-human to whom the skull belonged lived. So at the Swartkrans cave, archaeologists discovered more fossils, like for instance, a lower jaw, an upper jaw, and the right half of an adult male pelvis. So now that we have covered the most notable Paranthropus robustus discoveries in South Africa, it's time to look into the other two species, Boise and Ethiopicus. So in 1958, at the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, Mary Leakey discovered a portion of a skull sticking out of the ground. The following day, she and a team of excavators went back to the site to excavate the skull. They actually waited a full day to excavate the skull because it seemed like they wanted photographer Des Bartlett to document the entire process. And it actually took him a day to arrive at the site. Unfortunately, the cranium wasn't intact and it actually had to be reconstructed from the fragments that were scattered in the scree. For those who maybe not know this, scree is a collection of broken rock fragments at the base of a cliff, for instance. There are more examples of scree, but I'm just going to give you this one. The skull had large teeth and jaws and it resembled the Nutcrackers. So a newspaper who wrote about this discovery named it the Nutcracker Man. So later on, this skull was actually seen as a new species and it was given the name of Synjanthropus boisei. But as time went on, this name was changed to Paranthropus boisei and this skull was seen as the type specimen of the Paranthropus boisei species. And for those saying that I say species wrong because it's species, it, 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 I don't like it. It's species for me. I'm Dutch and I have an accent and sometimes you have to accept that. But back to the skull, this skull was actually dated and it is at least 1.8 million years old. Richard Leakey, who's actually the son of Louis and Mary Leakey, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year on January 2nd, 2022, he discovered a Paranthropus boise skull in 1970 in the Kubifora in East Turkana in Kenya. This skull most likely belongs to a female, as it has a smaller face and no sagittal crest along the top of the brain case. There is, of course, a small chance that this skull belongs to a young male. This is always difficult to determine exactly. A young male and a female skull will look similar. Although the males all had the sagittal crest, so therefore it's most likely a female. And this skull has been dated to 1.7 million years ago. In East Turkana, there's also been the discovery of a male lower jaw. And another notable find was the 2.3 million year old lower jaw that was discovered in Omo in Ethiopia. And this lower jaw is the biggest example of a jaw in this entire genus. 
And lastly, the most notable fossils from Paranthropus aethiopicus. And the type specimen of this species was discovered in 1968 at the Omokibi site in Ethiopia. This type specimen is a toothless mandible. And then there's the discovery of the so-called black skull, which was discovered in 1985 by Alan Walker in West Turkana, Kenya. This black skull <laughs> dates back to 2.5 million years ago and has more archaic features than all the other Paranthropus species that are younger. So the face of this skull is very projecting compared to the more recent fossils. So it seems like none of the Paranthropus species have been a direct ancestor to us, Homo sapiens sapiens, or, you know, otherwise better known as modern humans. It does seem likely that Paranthropus aethiopicus is a descendant of Australopithecus afarensis, or maybe even from Australopithecus anamensis. It seems like this branch in the evolutionary tree went a different route than the branch that eventually led to the evolution of us modern humans. And as we know, their branch died out and our branch led to us. Yay! So many anthropologists do agree that Paranthropus aethiopicus was the direct ancestor of Paranthropus boisei. While the ancestry of Paranthropus robustus is debated and unclear. However, there are some anthropologists that believe that Aethiopicus is the ancestor of Robustus, although there are also some other anthropologists that believe that Australopithecus africanus is the direct ancestor of Paranthropus robustus. And then there's, you know, people like me <laughs> that are open to the speculation that Paranthropus robustus might be a hybrid species with the ancestors being Australopithecus africanus and Paranthropus aethiopicus. Who's to say that there wasn't a mix and it eventually led to Paranthropus robustus? And, you know, since I'm not a scholar and not an anthropologist, I feel like I have the freedom to look into the plausibility of such a speculation. And yeah, that's about the only speculation that I will make about this entire species and genus and all that stuff. It's speculations like these that actually make it harder for anthropologists to be certain where these species belong. Do they belong in their own genus of Paranthropus or do they belong in the genus of the Australopithecines? What I didn't tell you is that there are scientists that actually call these three species the Robusts or the Robust Australopithecines. And as you can imagine, none of this is actually helping the debate. It's making it more difficult. So the Paranthropus genus have their own unique features and this makes it harder for anthropologists to place them in the Australopithecus genus because there are key differences and therefore it seems like they don't belong in the Australopithecus genus. It makes it more plausible that they do belong in their own genus of Paranthropus. So I think it's time to look into the morphology of the Paranthropus species as all three of them share similar characteristics in their physical appearance. For instance, we know that they have a relative small body and a strongly built robust skull with large lower jaws and extremely large molar teeth. I mean, that nutcracker stuff came from something. So the body of the males in these three species were significantly larger than the bodies of the females and the rib cages seemed more cone-shaped and this is a very ape-like feature in their morphology as human rib cages are more barrel-shaped. Aethiopicus seemed to have been the largest of the three species, although all three species were still larger than Australopithecus africanus. The brain sizes of all three were relatively small. For Aethiopicus, it seemed to have been around 420 cubic centimeters, and for Robustus and Boise, it seemed to have been around 520 cubic centimeters. Of course, please do remember that Aethiopicus was the earliest and the oldest of the three species. Therefore, 
the most archaic features will be found in them. So it's not weird that their brain size was the smallest. So the skulls of these three species had ape-like cranial features. And what I mean when I say this is a flat forehead and prominent brow ridge. The face was actually quite broad and had flaring cheekbones. Although, like I mentioned earlier, Paranthropus aethiopicus had a more projecting face, which was less flat than the other two species that came later. So the males of all three of these species had a massive bony ridge called a sagittal crest on the top of their skulls. According to anthropologists, this ridge acted as an anchor for their powerful jaw muscles. All three species had their spinal cords pass through the center of the skull base. This is a very clear indication that all three of these species walked upright, at least for the majority. The jaws were, as mentioned a couple times now, I think, <laughs> very robust and large. Perfect for the attachment of powerful chewing muscles and the front teeth, the incisors and the canines were very small when compared to the extremely large molars. I can just already read all the nutcracker jokes in the comments and in the chat. Thanks, guys. The legs of all three species had human-like features, another indication that the species were able to walk upright. Although the arms were very long when compared to the legs, just like we have seen in the Australopithecines. The pelvis was nearly identical to that of the species in the Australopithecus genus, built for walking on two legs, but without the refinements of the striding gait of us modern humans. Most of the anthropologists are of the belief that the Paranthropus species did not create any stone tools, but that they may have used unmodified stones to access some of the hard nuts that were part of their diet. Personally, I find this quite strange that they believe this. The oldest stone tools date back to more than 3 million years ago. I actually made a video on that. They probably lived close to the Australopithecus species, maybe even later on the Homo species, and I find it extremely hard to believe that they were unable to create simple, basic stone tools like their Australopithecus cousins. And I think my gut was actually right about this, because later on in my research, I found that the Leakies discovered animal bones with cut marks and stone tools from the Old One stone tool industry, very close to the fossils belonging to Paranthropus boisei. It always helps to keep on researching. Even if you think your script is done, you keep on reading because you might find a gem like this. This find actually suggests that Paranthropus boisei was indeed able to create stone tools, and this could also suggest that boisei ate meat. It also has been suggested that these three species may have lived in small social groups that were based around one dominant male and several females, like we actually see with the gorillas these days. I also saw an article that chimpanzees killed a gorilla. I mean, I have to look into that. Maybe they're going through their evolutionary phase. The environments in which these three species lived were mostly open savanna, grasslands and woodlands, and their diet would have been mostly fruits, seeds, nuts and roots, and maybe, maybe some small amounts of meat. Their tooth wear patterns also indicate this. All three species seem to have lived in wetlands along the rivers and the lakes as well, and mostly in places in Africa with an average temperature of 25 Celsius, which equates to 77 Fahrenheit during the day. We also know that Paranthropus robustus and Paranthropus boisei lived around the same time and thus coexisted with Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo erectus, or otherwise known as Homo ergaster. Although there are some people that say that Homo ergaster is a different species than Homo erectus. I'll look into that later on. It's also very unclear how these species all interacted with each other. It's also possible that Paranthropus boisei used the discarded tools created by Homo habilis, and that actually may explain why they were discovered alongside some old one stone tools. Another possibility, which is a little more gruesome, <laughs> let's get into it, is that Homo habilis killed the Paranthropus boisei individual 
for food. It's an option, and as you can imagine, it's unclear which one of the given options is what actually happened. Unless, you know, someone builds a time machine and makes it possible for us to travel back in time this far. We really do need to fix that flux capacitor, Doc, because, you know, I need to travel back in time. I want to learn more. And until we have a time machine, <laughs> it will remain unclear if these species belong in their own genus or, you know, not. Are they Paranthropus or are they Australopithecus? It's very unclear and we probably will never know. Maybe one day we discover more fossils and these questions can be answered and the mysteries will maybe one day be solved. Maybe not. Time will tell, I think. Um, but with that said, this was the information that I could find about the Paranthropus genus and do these species belong in a genus of their own or should they be placed in the Australopithecus genus? Let me know what you think in the chat or in the comments down below. Yeah, with that said, if you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos and click that bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I upload. If you haven't seen my previous videos yet, then click the card in the upper right corner or, you know, click a link in the description down below or click a video in the end card. The end card is always set to best for viewer. So YouTube caters to you and what it is that you like to see. I would also like to say a massive, massive, massive thank you to all my patrons and my channel members. Thank you so much for supporting me. It means the world to me and I will be eternally grateful for all your help. And like I said in the beginning, this is a different location for this video. This is not my usual location. I just had to, you know, film somewhere because um, I couldn't film at home. That can happen. With that said, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video that will be filmed as per usual in my studio at home, according to plan. I mean, that's the plan. Can't actually promise that, but I'll try my best. Okay, <laughs> enough of me blabbing. Bye guys.